kind of wish there was more footage or audio of him because it wasn't much. It was pretty like, it, it was just very little, like 10 to 20 seconds. And I just took what I could from it. And I just remember how slow and high it was. It was like, um, my brother and I were trying to go down the highway. And, the, and I'm like, I can't do that for six episodes. Uh, I will, you know, it will become an SNL uh spoof and i'll <laughs> i'll be done so so hello everyone i'm Kristen baldwin from entertainment weekly thank you for being here tonight we are thrilled to be joined by the man who just creeped us all out in that episode of apple tv plus drama blackbird please welcome paul walter hauser <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for coming out, uh, knowing it was rush hour traffic, plus apparently Joe Biden yeah. and Harry Styles and Lil Nas X and uh, the Antichrist. I mean, it was like a whole thing outside. So the fact that you're even here is uh, is very sweet and cool of you. Please, uh, you, have, you have my warmest thank you for being here. Well, and thank you for being here. So you've played a lot of real life people, uh, including, you know, in uh, Richard Jewell and I, Tanya, and of course, Blackbird. Uh, what appeals to you about doing projects that are based on a true story? I think so <laughs> selfishly, it's kind of like a, like you're cheating, like there's immediate interest, like, like adapting a hit book. Um, the coolest IP to me was always uh, real life stuff. You know, if you tell me there's a movie about um, a bombing or a movie about um, a figure skater or a movie about a serial killer, I'm, I'm automatically going to be a little bit more drawn to it. Um, I also, I also like once again, it's kind of a cheat as actors. We have some actors in the house, obviously. So it's like if somebody tells you that there's 10 minutes or 10 hours of footage of the character you're playing it is immensely helpful right um even a photograph can be can be helpful and i think we're all in the same boat when i say you will take anything you can get your hands on to improve uh the process and your craft and so for this role in particular how did it come to you and were you immediately like okay yes serial killer or what I <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny. A lot of people were like, well, "Did you have any trepidation about taking on this role?" And I was, I was kind of like, "No, I, I, not not like I don't know. Not I. Do you know what I mean though? Like, uh, isn't there something kind of fun about playing something uh, kind of naughty, a drug dealer or a drug addict or a crooked cop or a, like it's it's interesting. Uh, obviously, unless you love playing the straight woman or straight man or, or a straight." um person i i think i think i i'm more attracted to playing these crazier things uh as far as the process i think they had a m much more famous person attached and uh didn't work out for whatever reason and and then somebody recommended me and that somebody was taryn edgerton when i guess he had seen richard jewell or something and he said i think it's this guy so i did an audition over zoom with dennis lahane Wow. Got to creep him out, which means a, <laughs> it's good. He's written some creepy, creeptastic stuff. So when you creep him out, that's a good sign. And and they uh, they called me in and said, you're the guy. Well, and uh, I read in one interview, you said that for you, the key to playing a character like this uh, is you had to approach him like a real person and not like a monster. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about how in this case you view you know how did you come to sort of approach him as a real person a real guy even though obviously he's done all these monstrous things right um yeah it's hmm. it, it just the word serial killer like it can be it can be a thing where like suddenly you're you're wanting to play it scary you know somebody said to me Somebody said to me something to the effect of like, did you watch any serial killers to get inspired for your part? And I'm like, 
What did I want? Like, I don't see how me watching Charlie Manson interviews on YouTube is going to help me play Larry Hall. Uh, I, I, I just looked at it like this guy needs a foundation with which we build the character. And the foundation is he's lonely. He's angry. He feels misunderstood. He um, is an abuse victim. There's like a litany of things that if I spoke to each and every one of you, I bet I could pull it out of each of you that there's something you have that Larry Hall has. So I know I know I did. So for me, once you lay that foundation of humanity, then you can go in and say, I'm going to eat the bread in this fashion. I'm going to keep leaning on walls like a freaking cat that's, uh, you know, roaming through a house that isn't there. It's like you, you find all the other fun things once you've done the real homework of the humanity. And in terms of homework, um, you know, you, you talked earlier about how, you know, it's a little bit of a cheat when it's a real person, you can get some information. Totally, totally a cheat. <laughs> but when possible, when you're playing a, a real person, do you like to meet the person if, it, if that's possible? And in this case, was that something you thought about? Because um, he's alive. Maybe if I played some, some easier uh, <laughs> folks. I mean, the, Sean Eckhart and I, Tanya, uh, passed away in 07. Uh, Richard Jewell uh, tragically passed away in 07. Um, and then Larry's in jail, uh, thank God. <laughs> um, uh, there And there are people that I would like to play. Like, I, I have a fascination with Theodore Roosevelt, you know. he's um, He had liberal and conservative qualities, and at the heart of him, he also uh, was a very broken man dealing with PTSD and anger and rage and depression. So, like... Uh, I guess meeting the person, I feel like it doesn't always help. And sometimes those people are also like then wanting to have their hand in the performance and micromanage it and stuff. And that I think I, I'm such a people pleaser at heart. I think I would have trouble with that. Makes sense. Um, so I but yeah, dead guys. <laughs> I, just want, I want to play more dead guys. Dead guys. There's yeah. a lot of information about them, but you don't have to meet them. Exactly. <clears throat> so uh, I would imagine that you know, shooting this and playing this role in such a dark story was, you know, a burden on your soul to some degree. So at the end of the day, were you able to decompress? How do you decompress? Are you able to leave the role, you know, quote unquote, at work? Yeah, it's, um, you know, we use the word burden and stuff. It's care We got to be careful because like there are people that, you know, their hands are calloused from a shovel yes. every day. <laughs> so it's like, it's I still have on. people putting an umbrella over my head and handing me an omelet every morning on set. So it's, uh, but you know, in the acting game itself, yeah, no, it was very burdensome. Um, I had to drop 40 pounds to, I went from like 286 to 246 to try to look more like the real guy because I'm a big boy. Uh, I had to keep that weight off in New Orleans, which is known for its food and <laughs> alcohol. <clears throat> Uh, I had to do that voice for the character, which, you know, is based on his real voice. I, uh, I, had, to, I had to just think some thoughts that aren't fun, because if you don't think the thought, it doesn't translate in the eyes. And, uh, and so you have, you know, thinking of, and not to gross everybody, but well, you just watch the damn thing. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, think, thinking about doing something sexual to a dead body, like things like that. It's, uh, nobody wants to think about that stuff. But if you don't, you guys know I'm I'm phoning it in and I'm full of full of shit. So I, I you have to go there with that, and uh, and uh, and then we had a hurricane roll through and we were evacuated to Texas for a week. And then I got COVID while I was evacuated and uh, I had to switch Airbnbs a bunch because my my air conditioning broke while I was in the summer in New Orleans. Like there were just a million things that popped up that turned a four month shoot into a five and a half month shoot in which I ended up getting sober and get checking into uh, that anonymous group. And, um, and so, yeah, now I can look back on it, you know, a year later and I'm just like, I'm proud of the show. It kind of helped me grow up in a way. It kind of revealed things about me that I needed to change. And, and, uh, and I like what I did. I, I, you know, I like me and Taryn's chemistry. I think, I think we, we had a good little dance going. Yes. Mm. Yeah, thanks. I had... Hope I didn't overshare just now. Oh, I don't, you didn't. I, I don't know how to self-edit and be like... I, 
I don't know how to look fancy or cool. I just got to say my, my stuff. Well, I actually want to ask you about it, if you don't mind, because I had read it in uh, another interview where you mentioned that sh while shooting episode four mm -hmm. was when you got, you said you literally got sober in that, while shooting that episode. And I guess, is there, what you're comfortable sharing, was there a connection between this project and that decision or how did that tie it, together? I mean, it was, uh, and to be fair and to make sure I categorize it with truth, I, I needed to get sober just for me prior to even getting the job. Uh, Cause I became one of those people that was like, uh, you know, marijuana helps me sleep and it helps with depression and I'm bored and I'm going to watch a sci-fi movie so I should get high for that. Like <laughs> it just became this, it became like uh this wonder ingredient to to sort of mask pain and enjoy or get through pieces of life and i just had to chill out so uh so yeah no that, that i was on that trajectory anyway but while i'm doing the show it was just it was exhausting emotionally i wasn't in a good place and um and by episode four there was so much dialogue in this cafeteria episode we're cleaning this cafeteria and it's basically like a play on film me and taryn and I just remember a couple days where I wasn't that sharp and I was forgetting dialogue or sort of like putting my own synonym phrasing into it rather than Dennis Lehane's immaculate writing. And I just stopped one day and I pulled my assistant, Anthony Pettix, aside and I said, hey, uh, it was like a Thursday. I said, on Saturday, you need to throw the bar card out. Uh, I need to be done. And the next morning I woke up on a Friday and it was gone. He didn't even give me that because he knew his, he has addicts in his family. And he told me, he's like, you know, I, I knew you wanted your last hurrah. I wasn't going to give it to you. And a uh, good, good friend um, in that sense. Uh, and yeah, no, I, it was, it was really helpful to get through that. And, and I think my best work came as a result. Not that, not that I phoned it in or showed up to set drunk. It was never something like that, but it was, a more tired, uh, frail version of me uh, that was showing up. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about uh, the chemistry with Taryn because obviously so much of the success of this show rests on the audience, you know, buying into this growing friendship between Larry and Jimmy. And so, and you guys have a very authentic chemistry. Uh, how would, how did you, how did that develop? Uh, yeah, I got a weird like insecurity thing where I, Whenever I see like pretty guys who I view as more handsome than me, I have like a thing in my head that goes back to high school where I'm like, they're not going to like me. I'm the, I'm the theater kid. They're the jock or something. And I had that with Sebastian Santa and I, Tanya and John Hamm going into R Richard Jewell and Tar Taryn with this show. And it, and it's, uh, it, it turns me on my head every time. These guys are wonderful. Taryn, I just knew was a great actor. I, I didn't question that. I was like, man, this, between Rocket Man and Kingsman and his voice singing in that movie Sing. Uh, I was like, this guy is, he kind of reminds me of Hugh Jackman where I feel like there's nothing he can't do if he puts his brain and, and voice to it. Um, so I was excited to work with him and, and we just got really deep really quickly where I, uh, I remember there was a night where we were drinking together in his kitchen and we just like kept hugging each other and like grabbing each other. Like, this is such a big thing. Like we're, I'm so excited to go on this journey with you. I like put a cigarette out on my arm, uh, like to prove my love to the guy when I first met him or something like it was just very aggressively bro. -y. It was very much a, there's nothing I won't do for you. I'll die for you on this show, you know? And I think that's just two young lovey guys who want to do great work and want to trust the other guy. And, uh, and I found that that's a really important thing because I've worked with some guys or gals who it's just not there and it's never as good. Um, but when a guy like Sam Rockwell is like, come to, my, come to my place in the village and we'll eat chocolate and drink cognac and watch Rain Man together. Like when, when that adult make-a-wish presents itself, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's like it, it, the friendship and the chemistry starts long before they yell action. Well, and I uh, read in an interview, you said that you're, you're often very sort of uh, deliberate about trying to find time to hang out with your co-stars off cameras to help build that rapport. Is that something that's always been part of your process? Yeah, and not, not consciously, I don't think. Now, now it's a bit more strategic where I'm like, let's make sure we spend some time together. Uh, and you never want to, I'm also one of those guys who I'm just like, let's all be best friends. Like I... <laughs> 
it's it doesn't need to be that way and uh and that's just my own thing uh you want to give people their space too but i think i just i just think it's all about trust you know they say it's about listening it's it's definitely as much about trust because if if somebody's bullying you on set or you they don't make time for you it's like it just sets a precedent where you don't you don't feel like you have the same emotional environment so i want to talk of course about larry's distinctive voice which you mentioned and uh I believe you found something like 12 seconds of audio of the real Larry online and also developed it sort of through your own choices. Can you talk a little bit about that? I kind of wish there was more footage or audio of him because it wasn't much. It was pretty like, it, it was just very little, like 10 to 20 seconds. And I just took what I could from it. And I just remember how slow and high it was. It was like, um, my brother and I were trying to go down the highway and, the, and I'm like, I can't do that for six episodes. Uh, I will, you know, it will become an SNL, uh, spoof and I'll, I'll be done. So, so I remember, I, you know what? I love Peter Sarsgaard when he played, uh, Bobby Kennedy in that film with Natalie Portman. He, you know, he, he did not play it like a Kennedy in this fashion. You know, it was, it wasn't a Simpsons Kennedy. It was like a, it was a real person. Uh, and I know Mahershala Ali, who I think is one of the five greatest actors alive. Mahershala said when he did uh, Green Book playing a real guy, he's like, that doctor's register was actually higher pitched. And he was afraid it would be distracting uh, for the audience if he played it that way. So I, I basically tried to honor his real voice, but make it accessible and hopefully not a total distraction during the duration of the show. Well, and as you pointed out, I mean, maintaining, you know, a vocal choice like that over a prolonged shoot has got to be a real challenge. Now that you've gone through that, what advice can you give your uh, oh, fellow actors about uh, what you learned I, about making it work? I lost my voice twice on, on this shoot. And and I just, I mean, I, I mainlined, mainlined like mint and lemon tea and ginger and I just was drinking it nonstop. You know how they say you, you got to drink water when you got a kidney stone, and you're like, I'm getting that some bitch out of me. Uh, this this is just like that, where you just have to you have to be chugging it and resting. Um, that's the best advice I can give. I think Andy Serkis, when he did the Lord of the Rings movies, and he did that Gollum voice. He he's got his own recipe online, I think, for <laughs> how to keep that going. And is it there a, a mental aspect to it as well, in terms of like? make it in terms of being vigilant that it doesn't like you said become you know a cartoon yeah I, I so much of it is not i don't know i don't i i didn't go to acting school i probably should have uh, <laughs> I, I didn't go to acting school but i know that when for you raise your hand if you went to like a conservatory or something anybody okay so like they yeah a few of you they teach you like uh your body has to be completely like relaxed before a take right and then as you inhabit, you embody and the body does its own thing in character. I, I catch myself all the time starting tight, anticipating whatever is going to happen, or it's not even about the scene. And that's the worst where you're mad about traffic. You're mad about pouring water on your laptop accidentally, whatever it is. Um, so for me, the best vocal choices and breath and, and sincerity always came out when I was able to breathe and take my time and work from the basement, not the head tone. And, uh, and I was happy with what they did. You know, I, I, think, I think it works. I think, I don't know, you never know. It works. Yeah. Uh, so I wanna talk, of course, about that woodshop confession scene in the episode that, mm. uh, that uh, we just saw. You know, it's such a crucial scene it's so important to the story, but it's also, you know, a long, intense, dialogue-heavy scene. Can you tell us a little bit about the experience of filming it? Was it a super long day? Did you, you know, what was the, what, what was it like trying to get that right? Uh, that that day was, uh, you know what, I immediately have to call out the crew. The crew that day was like dead quiet. They just knew this is going to take a long time. This is a lot of dialogue. It's not fun to say that stuff. And we got to somehow get this um, in, you know, eight hours or whatever we have. And 
I was so grateful that they, that they kept it professional because I've been on other jobs where I'm doing a death scene and people are like, did you see this on Twitter? And I'm just like, <laughs> oh, my God, stop. <laughs> like, It's like asking you know a guy on a jackhammer if he can juggle for a minute. It's like, leave me alone. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I the – the crew set the tone, and then Taryn and I basically did a somewhere to the episode four cafeteria, like a play on film, and and uh, I, I remember at one point we had done enough takes that I was trying to give it my own thing, and the physicality was a thing where I'm like, how do I how do I try to make Taryn relive it? Taryn's character Jimmy, how do I make him relive it with my hand motions? So I'm like. Uh, Beating, beating on her and ragging her, and then the thing with the belts. and like it, It's like a kid saying, like, and then the papal airplane goes like this, and then it falls, and they would, like, they would be animated. Uh, so how, how can an adult have that same childlike animation, but it's the worst thing you would ever want to hear? And uh, I had read in one interview that you, at one point, were hoping to do it in one take, but that seems unlikely <laughs> oh no we we did do it oh, yeah. well we did do it in that one take at the end it does the slow push I and see, then they okay. curve around and that was um our brilliant uh camera operator this guy colin mcdonald he he got that and that was what was tough about that though is that i have the camera in my periphery and i'm trying to time it so i end as they end so it's like i'm still trying to do the scene but there's like a, a mental physical choreography to try to get it at the same time as the camera and that's yeah that's that sucks that's <laughs> trying to hold the baby while you cook so you know the show is very scary and chilling but it you know never visually depicts any of thank god hilarious. yeah and i don't I, like stuff like that when it's really gruesome i prefer like a psychological character thing you know because i was going to ask you if that had been part of the role would that have been something you were comfortable with? I don't know that I would have done it if it were that. Um, I, have a really, I have a really sensitive spirit. You know, when I was a little kid, they say, you know, careful little ears what you hear, careful little eyes what you see. And that may sound very, you know, uh, Mother Goose to a lot of folks, but um, it's true. If you doomsday scroll all day and decide to fill your brain with every bad headline from here to Timbuktu, you better believe that by tomorrow... It will have done something to you, whether you know it or not. Um, so when I choose a role, uh, I don't mind doing something edgy or crazy, but there also has to be parameters to that, and there has to be purpose. If it's not purpose, and suddenly we're just, you know, uh, moonwalking in puddles of blood, I'm not okay with it. Um, so I felt like this had a purpose. Yeah. So there is one scene between uh, that you share with the late Ray Liotta, um, and you got a round of applause for that, dude. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And Man. you know he plays Jimmy's father, Big Jim. Um, God, had you God. met him prior to this project? And oh no, I was geeking out. Yeah. <laughs> what was, was your experience out. like working with him? Well, I, I mean, I obviously I didn't get to work with him very long. Uh, you'll see, for those who haven't seen episode six, there's a little, you know, tiny, tiny. I don't know, I, I swear, I'm not giving anything away, I promise. <laughs> there's just a tiny, like, visual thing that Ray and I are in at the same time. And uh, I worked with him for half a day. But we also did the table read together, and it was like, I don't know, I, I still get excited. It's not like it, it certainly hasn't worn off on me if I see some actor I love, like Viola Davis or Dustin Hoffman or something, like I'm gonna get excited. And Ray was one of those people. Uh, him and Greg Kinnear, they're just the kind of guys who every time they show up, you feel taken care of. Like this, this person gives a damn, they're gonna bring something interesting. I was a huge fan of Field of Dreams and Goodfellas. I had seen Karina Karina in theaters as a little kid, him and Whoopi. And I just, I just loved the guy. So I, I thought he was going to be a hard ass. I didn't think he was going to be cool. And then I thought he'd be kind of like, stay away, kid, no autographs. <laughs> and instead, it was total opposite. Like, he invited questions, gave me a big hug, gave me his phone number. He's like, come on. Uh, you know, when we're done here, you and me should uh, go grab dinner with my girl. She's got to meet you. You're hilarious. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I, he gave me the fuzzies right away. And, uh, and I, the fact that Taryn got that intimacy with him, I'm... Uh, eternally jealous that they got to do that together is it true i read in one interview that uh i guess he had seen 
he, he had been on set for one of your scenes and he was impressed by one of your improvised lines and complimented you by calling you a sick puppy. Oh, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I, it was during, it was during the, the brief, brief sequence thing I did with, with Ray. Uh, there, there was, I, I just like to, if I know we got the take, if we're on take five, it's like, you got whatever I was going to give. Let me try to sauce it up. And I either improvise something new entirely or I just doctor it, um, which I've been doing since I started. I'd rather ask forgiveness than permission. Um, <laughs> might not want to do it in an audition, by the way. That doesn't go over well. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I, I said something uh, disgusting in this moment. It was, like, vague, but the what it connoted, what it connotes is disgusting. And the second they yelled action, he looked at me and he went, oh, 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 oh boy, you are one sick puppy and like backed away from me. It was, yeah, it was a fun sign off. Uh, so there is a sort of confrontation scene. I won't spoil anything in the, in the finale between Jimmy and Larry. And I read that you had, you know, you were trying different things sort of during this physical moment. And at one point you even put your fingers in Taryn's mouth, and I, I want to hear from you about, you know, in those moments, trusting your instincts and why that's important to you as an important, you know, why it's valuable as a performer. That's a really cool question. Um, no, no, really, like it's, do you ever, I'm trying to equate it to something else, do you ever, are you ever headed somewhere and then on your way there you go, there's gotta be a better route than this, and you look at your watch or whatever, uh, you, you do that with acting sometimes, I think, um, if you allow yourself to. Uh, it just takes a certain measure of freedom to, if you're in character and you go, what do I think the character would do? You do it. Um, another thing, though, is also this idea of what are you trying to elicit from your scene partner? And in that moment, I'm trying to make Taron, you know, because he's like Mr. Tough Guy, the women, the fighting, the money, the cars. In that moment, I'm trying to make him feel as scared as humanly possible and revert him to childhood. So I'm, I'm trying to bring a nightmare into his real life. And I thought, I bet you Taryn slash Jimmy would be very put off if I started to crawl my fingers into his mouth and touch his tongue and try to get my hand in his mouth. So I did that on two takes. And, uh, and, but Taryn and I also love each other. We're trying to make a good show. I don't recommend you do that in an audition, but... Um, <laughs> If, you, if you're in that environment, that emotionally, you know, supported environment, you do do stuff like that. To, uh, there was something that happened with Sebastian Stan and I once where on I, Tanya, where and Sebastian will never admit to this, even though I talk about it all the time. He, <laughs> we did a take in this kitchen where we're arguing, and he's like, you're an idiot, and he's yelling at me and stuff. And in one take, he grabbed me by the throat, and he didn't choke me hard, hard, but it wasn't just like fake theater choking where I grab his wrists and go, no, it was like a real choke. So the next take, I just went, okay, I got it. And, uh, and then he came toward me again and I slapped him. <laughs> and similar, similar to the choke, it wasn't a theater slap. Uh, and then after the take, he looked at me fuming and he's like, <sighs> and I'm like, I don't think he's in character anymore. <laughs> I think he's pissed <laughs> off that I hit his beautiful face. And, uh, <laughs> So you never know how it's going to turn out. But with Taryn, it was also like, let's get this scene. We can't screw this up. Let's get weird. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, your other standout performance of the year, uh, that of Stingray in Cobra Kai, season five especially. Um, what do you enjoy most about playing that character? I, I think my wife says I'm too self-deprecating, but I'm also just honest. Uh, I know Marvel and DC aren't knocking on my door asking me to do stuff, you know? Uh, and so like, I, it'd be fun to be a part of some action -y type of world where you get to do something really fun and, and physical. And Cobra Kai is one of those shows where it's, it's got this wonderful fan base. Uh, it has equal parts heart and comedy and then really impressive action. Uh, and, and so getting to kind of play in that world, I'll call it, even though it's a, supposedly a grounded show it's so out of control but playing in that world is a lot of fun and uh and everybody there is grateful and gracious there's no egos it's a bunch of people 
and including the young people, by the way. Like, I have hope for the future because of <laughs> Jacob Bertrand and Shola Merdwin and all these people on the show. These kids are more uh, more well-behaved than the adults. And and I love getting to hang out with those guys and, and tell them stories. And they ask me advice. And I feel it's fun, you know. And as a performer, I mean, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but that you went from production on Blackbird to Cobra Kai, like that's quite a transition in terms of your headspace. Uh, what is it, you know, is it hard to switch gears so abruptly or so or just significantly? It, my, first, it, my first thought is like, no, it's not hard. But then what's funny is I do remember being on the set of Cobra Kai and like overthinking stuff. Like I was trying to make everything mean something and matter. And I was kind of like, it was like my brain was still in uh, Larry Hall mode. And then I did a movie with Sidney Sweeney called National Anthem. I shot that in New Mexico this past uh, February, March. And I caught myself a few times doing weird stuff that I had done uh, in Blackbird where like Larry Hall would repeat Hey, angel guy, you okay? That's my kiddo. You want to bring him down? Can I hold him? Uh, oh, bring him. Hey, buddy. Oh, this guy. He's tired. We had a long day. I did, I did live with Kelly and Ryan, and then we did a bit for Colbert, and then we, uh, we had an interview, and then we went to the Brooklyn Bridge and got a bite to eat at Industry Kitchen. And then we came here, and traffic was like 46 hours. Come here, buddy. Come here. This is my wife, Amy. She did all the hard work with this guy. Hey, buddy. Oh. Hey, you cute guy. You got something to say? <laughs> um, this sweet little guy. He's so fashion forward. He really is. Who dressed you? Elton John's house manager? <laughs> Uh, Larry Hall would sometimes repeat stuff where uh, James would say something and I'd go, and I'd be like repeating what he was saying before answering him. And the director caught me doing that on the Sidney Sweeney film. He was like, he's like, you keep repeat, you keep repeating like the person's dialogue who spoke before you. And I stopped, I go, like I was caught. I was like, oh God, I'm sorry. I, I did that with a character six months ago. It was very embarrassing. So uh, this is a safe space. You're among uh, fellow actors. So tell us about the worst audition you've ever had. Oh, wow. The, wor the worst audition I ever had was probably, oh, golly. I think the worst audition, I oh, there's been a couple. One of them, I went in for some Disney show. This is like 2015 or 16. And at the time, I was on this show called Kingdom with Frank Grillo and Jonathan Tucker, a bunch of wonderful people. And I forgot my uh, headshot. And when I showed up to that audition, these women looked at me like I had farted during the eulogy or something. <laughs> like, they were so upset about this headshot. And I said to them, I'm like, yeah, you, you can go to IMDb. I mean, my face is there or, you know, it's here. <laughs> I tried to make light of it or something, and, they, and then they got more pissed. And I was like, I'm going to see myself out. That was a bad one. Uh, and then I remember there was one where I auditioned for a show. Oh, it was the thing on WGN with David Morse. It was like Mountain oh, um, Families. Oh, no, no, Outsider. Outsider. So I auditioned for the role that went to Kyle Gallner, and I was really into it. Like, I wrote a song that the character sings. And in my audition, I did a weird thing where I, I like ate a five dollar bill, and uh, and I I got weird with it. Um, but then I remember they brought me in for the callback, and like there was a scene where like I had this like weirdly gratuitous uh, sex scene, and it dealt with a, uh, a a person who was transgender, and it wasn't thoughtful. It kind of made them look um, buffoonish rather than treated them as a human being. And I just told the producers after I nailed the audition, it was like Giamatti's guys and then the other producers. And I was like, yeah, uh, just so you know, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a man of faith, you know, I'm a Christian and something about this scene rubs me the wrong way morally. It doesn't feel great. Uh, I don't think I'll be doing that if you do give me the part. And they looked at me like, 
who the hell do you think you are? Uh, you're not dictating anything. But I thought it was only fair that if I was going to be squeamish about doing it, they should hire the person who's, like, good to go. Yeah. You know, that's not fair to them if they give me the opportunity and then I act like a diva. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, that was – I remember telling my reps that. They weren't real happy. <laughs> and finally, because I – I see you have your hands full. Um, what would you say is the best advice about acting that you've ever received? Um, the best advice about acting I've ever received. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is Ed Harris on my first movie. It was called Virginia. And I was a huge fan of Ed, so it was a big deal getting to work with him on my first film. And I had a death scene, and I was... <laughs> that was embarrassing. I was walking around set with my headphones in listening to Coldplay. And I'm like moping around and I look like, you know, my dog just died. And he comes up to me and Ed is like, well, what's going on? I go, my death scene today. Trying to look like a serious actor, I'm sure. Like, look at, look at me, how hard I'm taking nothing. Uh, and then I said to Ed, I go, any advice? And Ed goes, it's like cowboys and Indians. Bang, you're dead. You fall on the ground. <laughs> and I was, you know, it was almost like Olivier telling Hoffman to try acting, dear boy. Uh, stop being, uh, stop being emo. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think the heart of that though is it's okay for things to be simple. Yeah. You know, they don't always have to be, uh, <laughs> grand, grandiose. Oh, okay, mama's got it. Here we go. God, that kid. It's so funny. Anybody have kids here? Raise your hand. <laughs> Yeah, like it's so weird. Like I, my before I had a family, I was my obsession, my love was this stuff, and I would read Deadline, and I was just dogged in my ambition, unhealth, unhealthily so. And then now I got them, and when I look at their faces, I'm just like, what the hell was I spending so much time <laughs> thinking about? It's, um, it's yeah, it's mind boggling. Um, at the heart of that advice, though, is you know, allow yourself to keep something simple. Edward Norton has a brilliant story about De Niro where he says he was doing this uh, film Stone, uh, which is not a good movie, by the way. Um, great actors in a bad film, which is always heartbreaking. And Ed Norton said that De Niro at one point pulled him aside and he goes, uh, hey, uh, you know, just uh, come here. And Ed is doing a real, Ed is taking a big swing. One of my favorite, I love Edward Norton. <clears throat> 25th Hour, Birdman, everything. But he was taking a big swing with this character, and De Niro goes, "Hey, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, I think I think you're here. I think it's this. I think it's this. <laughs> like, you gotta." And Ed is trying to be respectful. He adores De Niro. It's like, oh my God, it's De Niro. But but was literally telling him like, <laughs> pull it in or whatever. And Edward Norton's a fantastic actor, so clearly that can happen to anybody, no matter the role, no matter the project. Um, always remember that unless you are doing uh, Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow or, you know, Spy Kids 8, um, you, you are called to tell the truth, and the truth sometimes doesn't look as exciting as it should look honest. Well, that is great says advice. The guy who, <laughs> says the guy who acts like a whack job in every role. So I don't, <laughs> I'm like, you should all eat carrots and celery more and I, as I eat a slice of pizza. Well, I want to thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, all six episodes of Blackbird are streaming now on Apple TV Plus. And thank you so much to our esteemed guests. Give it up for Kristen Baldwin. <laughs> she didn't have to be here. She, she chose to talk to me this long. Thanks so much. Thank have you. a great night.